Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It's an oldie but a goodie. A VA Valiant Armory Knight's Templar sword, a medieval long sword from Valiant Armory. Now this one has some unique characteristics which you should know before I get into the nitty gritty of the review or the thing I'm about to say, and that is that this is a second hand model, one and two, it's older. Those are important because one, I believe the production methodology has changed somewhat from Valiant Armory, so Basically, if you like this sword, chances are what they make today is, is probably superior, but know that there may be some production differences between this model, given its age, and what they produce today. Secondly, as I noted, it's secondhand, which means that if it's a little rusted, a little used, a little scuffed up, don't hold it against Valiant Armory. It doesn't necessarily represent what they would send you if you were to buy one new from them. The other bit to note is that I, again, did buy it secondhand. I have my own money in it. It's not a review sample. It's my sword, and I'm... I'm reviewing it for shits and giggles, not because anyone is asking me to. I'm not affiliated with Valiant Armory. Nobody's paying me to do the review. Uh, just, I guess it's it's my shtick on YouTube. The other bit to note is that I'm not an expert or a student of historic European martial arts, so keep in mind that the things I say are, are just a sword enthusiast opinion. One guy's thoughts, not anything to be taken overly dramatically or seriously. So keep that in mind as you hear me ramble. Today on the Valiant Armory website, you can find this sword that retails for $519 or $590. I'm not sure exactly which price it goes between, and there are a few different options. You can have a peened assembly or a hex nut assembly. I guess it adds $100 to have a peen. Uh, there are a few different options in terms of coloration, in terms of color, and all of that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. You can... Uh, add all sorts of different bedazzlements to the sword. It's listed right now as being these dimensions. I'll include dimensions in the description down below along with an outline of the weapon dynamics computer. I do not know if the production has changed the dimensions overall. It's supposed to be made of 1060 steel. I believe that was the case for this model as well. And uh, this is the weight. Anyway, the, given that this is a current offering, I don't know how close the old version is to the new version or if there's really any difference at all. In any respect, you can find it on Valiant Armory's website, and I'll include a link to this particular page in the description down below. So as I look at this sword today, it is a $520 offering from Valiant Armory, and I have to keep that in contrast with the other offerings that are available, particularly as it comes with a scabbard, which can often be very expensive. So as you compare it to other swords on the market, say Albion, which I've, I've reviewed very positively, I've had many others in the past, uh, those are more expensive than $520, and they don't come with a scabbard. Uh, equivalently, if I look at some of the offerings from Dark Sword Armory or some of the other sword uh, companies out there that make European longsword type blades that include a scabbard in roughly the same ballpark, give or take a couple hundred dollars, that's kind of where I have to have to compare it to other offerings on the market. And so, um, what I'll tell you right out of the gate is that it's really quite positive. There are a lot of really nice things that this sword does that I don't think everyone else does. Anyway, we'll get into that in just a moment. Let's talk about the pommel now, and the first thing that I'm noting about the pommel is just the overall condition. It's going to be very difficult for me on the pommel, on the crossguard, on the sword, on every part of this sword, to distinguish between what imperfections came from the factory and which imperfections happened over the lifespan of this sword. As I noted, it's a second-hand sword that's seen some use, so which, which is... What do you expect if you buy a new one? In effect, I think you should expect some imperfections from a $520 sword. If you're expecting perfection from any sword, you're going to be disappointed. But at $520, bucks, do not expect perfection. Don't expect perfect symmetry. Expect some tooling marks. I see that on this sword, and if I say that it came from the factory, I guess I don't really know for sure. But in effect, don't expect perfection. I'm certainly not in the course of this review. In terms of the shape of the pommel, it's a little more interesting than you might expect. There's some facets and dimension to it that go beyond just a circular pommel. Now, this pommel likely has some sort of classification to it that I'm unfamiliar with, but I don't really think that's important. You can see the depth and dimension of the shape uh, by the video that I'm sharing with you. The faces of the cross are raised up and pitched at a slight angle. They don't look to be perfectly symmetrical, and there looks to be some general imperfection or some perhaps hand sanding that's gone on to finish this pommel. I'm guessing it was a cast piece by the overall construction, um, and some of the lines just aren't, aren't perfectly symmetrical. They waver slightly, which gives it a slightly handmade aesthetic and less machine-made. Though there are elements that make it look like a cast piece, whether it be these little uh, little inclusions or little pockets that look like they're from a, a poorly done cast, though those could certainly be somebody whacking the pommel uh, through the course of its life. Also, the cross section just has imperfections on it. I can't tell if that's something that has been caught on it, again, through its, its lifespan, but I'd venture a guess that some of the edges around the cross were 
were delivered this way from the factory. And underneath the cross, the flat of the cross section, has what looks like almost like a stippled texture or a paint texture. It's tough to say exactly, but in any case, it looks different than the remainder of the pommel. One thing I found by gripping the pommel as well is that it's not uncomfortable. It looks like it has some edges, but they've been intentionally, presumably, sanded down or tampered so that they don't bite into your hands. It's not uncomfortable to use without a glove. Now this particular construction is a hex nut construction, and it looks like the previous owner has tightened it down quite a bit, or maybe removed it or customized it or played with it. I'm not exactly sure. I've never had to tighten it down, and overall it's held up extremely well. I've had this sword for a few years now, and it's, it's held up remarkably well. I can't say I've used it a ton for cutting, but what I would say is the cutting that I've done, the maneuvering I've done, the, the handling I've done, or just the general temperature change of the room it's in hasn't caused the hex nut to, to loosen. It still remained very, very tight over the years I've had it. The grip is a green leather grip with some risers that matches the green scabbard. It so shows some signs of handling, which I can't say didn't come from the factory, though I'd venture, I guess, are, are just par for the course for a secondhand sword that's seen some handling. I also can't tell you exactly how this grip is constructed. I think the correct way would be to have a wood core bound in twine, then wrapped or glued with leather, then lacquered over. Though it might just be that the, the leather is over the wood and that the, the markings on here that look like twine underneath are the result of uh, the, the twine that binds the leather. Anyway, it's held up really, really well regardless of what it is. As I noted, this sword has been used, it's been handled, and it's quite old. And overall, the, the grip is still pretty well secured. It looks like uh, the previous owner put down a little bit of glue to cover some of the ledge, though that could have been from the factory as well. The leather seam hasn't risen up at all in any of the places I can feel, and it wasn't a bother to use at all. It's overall a very shapely grip. You can see that it's more cylindrical towards the pommel. Overall, it maintains a pretty elliptical shape that's easy to index. It has a swell in it towards where uh, you would primarily grab the sword that fits well and rests in the, the palm of my hand. I have pretty meaty sausage hands and overall I find it very comfortable to grip. And then it tapers slightly uh, as you move up towards the cross guard which helps the uh, really helps me grab the sword and keep it keep my keep the sword resting in my palm as I hold it with one hand. Um, and without my, my hand just inherently choking up towards the grip. There's, whether it be the risers or the shape, I feel like I can, I can comfortably hold the sword uh, and maintain a, a couple inches away from the grip if, if that's the way I want to hold it. Anyway, I don't know that necessarily the right way to hold the sword, but I would say that the grip is very comfortable and offers some versatility. Either way, regardless of how I hold it in my hand, I feel like I can index it and I feel like I can keep my hand there. It's not uncomfortable to hold with one hand, and it's pretty easy to get a second hand if I need to. At first glance, the cross guard looks to be a very simple shape, and I'm sure it has some sort of typology or name or classification that I'm not familiar with. Anyway, it has a simple shape at first glance, but when you look at it closer, it really has more depth to be discovered. The quillins have an octagonal shape, and they're tamfered edges. These tamfered edges aren't perfectly symmetrical, though none of the really imperfections on this cross guard draw my eye inherently. Usually I can make out some uh, some sort of lack of symmetry really really quickly but here I really have to start staring at it before I see imperfections. Anyway the quillins swell out they get wider towards the end and narrow towards the center and overall it's just it's an interesting take on a very simple shape. One thing I'm also noticing on the cross guard is that there is no residue left over for where it meets the grip. Again something I noted near the pommel something I appreciate because it doesn't doesn't look dirty or grubby underneath where the the pommel or where the, the cross guard meets the grip. Where the blade meets the cross guard as well has openings. Now this is something that I would I would like to see improved, but at the same time, not something I can really complain about for 500 bucks. There is a gap, it doesn't look like it's any more than two millimeters in some spots and one millimeter or less in others. For a $500-ish ballpark sword, this is actually quite good and quite uniform. Overall, it, it doesn't appear bad. I've seen much more expensive swords with much bigger openings near where the blade meets the cross guard. I think the ideal is that there's there's none, but to achieve that is is <laughs> quite painstaking. So uh, overall, I think that this is well within reason for the price point. Now, I do not know the construction method of the cross guard, if it's cast, if it's handmade. I, I can't necessarily say I can make out uh, what it is, how it's made necessarily, just by looking at it. 
Overall, though, the construction methodology looks quite good, and any imperfections I can see on it, rust or blemishes, I would probably attribute on this one to being secondhand and being used. There's not a lot of tooling marks, and overall the finish work is, is pretty good. It has a nice satin finish, and I could imagine it would look even better if it were brand new. Now I'm going to talk about the scabbard, and this scabbard is one of the highlights of this sword for me. It's really well executed and has some characteristics on it that I find both in just aesthetics as well as function are really quite good for the money, especially as I compare it to other scabbards on close to $500 swords that I've seen. Now, uh, this scabbard has a, a metal shape. It's covered in leather. It has some embellishments on it that uh, bear the same kind of cross that you would see on the pommel, though a little bit more elaborate. It's done in a green color, which is a custom color, I believe. Along the spine, it looks like it's glued rather than stitched, but it's held up overall quite well, and my fingers don't kind of latch on to any part of the leather along the back. However it's constructed, it seems to have held up really well. It doesn't appear to be peeling or bubbling in any spots on the sword. There are some imperfections, some scratches and scuffs and, and cuts in the leather, but uh, this is something that I would expect is, is par for the course for a secondhand sword that's seen some usage. I don't have the original belt uh, for the sword, so I, I can't attest to how good or bad that is, though the leather on the kind of mounting mechanism for the belt seems good. It doesn't look like the leather was stained after the, the leather was, was cut. I can make out some non-stained sections of the leather, which isn't necessarily bad. The buckles all seem to have held up well, and, uh, and overall, I don't know how well this, this fits on uh, in terms of how well it grabs onto a, uh, a belt or not. I, I don't have the belt to, to mount on and, and test. But there are some things that I really like about the scabbard in terms of how it functions. Now, it's not perfect, but it doesn't rattle. And if I compare this to some of the other offerings that I've seen on close to $500 swords, very often if you shake them, they're more like a shipping container than a well-fit scabbard. That might be due to the manufacturing tolerances. I don't know why. But either way, it doesn't rattle, which is a very good sign. Now, it does come out if I just hold it upside down, but it doesn't it doesn't fall out right away. It's a little more snug, though it could be could be snugger. And I think that's something that might be able to be fixed uh, if you have the skill to do so. I imagine it could be shimmed in some way, though it doesn't necessarily look easy. I'm not terribly competent in that way either. Also, the leather is covering the face of the scabbard. So uh, right near the mouth, the leather goes all the way up. And I'm pretty impressed with the execution on the scabbard. Along the metal shape, I do notice some glue. I don't know if perhaps the metal shape came off at some point and was glued back on, but I do make up some what looks like residue from glue. And towards the tip of the scabbard, I can make out the seam a little better, and it appears to go off-center more than it does in other portions of the, the scabbard. But overall, the scabbard is extremely well executed for $500. It's a really pretty looking scabbard, and again, for for the overall value or what you pay for this sword, it seems like a, a real bargain. A lot of times it would cost you more than $500 to get a scabbard made, or at least would cost you several hundred. So to get an entire package with a very elaborate scabbard is, uh, is really quite cool. Now we'll talk about the blade, and I'll put dimensions and all of that kind of stuff in the description down below, and I'll talk about how it handles and cuts and stuff in just a moment. But if I look at the overall execution of the blade itself, it's, it's really quite interesting. It has a slight distal taper that runs throughout the blade, and there are just some things that are hit here that are, are often missed. One, the fuller termination is in the same spot and approximately in the same way. Very often I will see fullers terminate in different ways and in different spots on either side of a blade, particularly as they're budget conscious blades. And this one seems to stop at the same spot, which is which is good. Also, there are surface ripples in the steel. Um, it does it does have some, but uh, for the money, I think it's actually pretty good. There's not there's not a ton of ripples in the surface of the steel, it seems actually reasonably well executed from that standpoint. It could be better, of course, but compared to many other swords in this price point, it actually seems seems pretty good. Uh, the polish work on it is tough for me to say if this is how it actually came, but it looks to have a, a pretty simple 800 to 600 grit satin type polish on it. It's not bad, uh, and it's also not hard to, to fix, so if it does get scratched up, it's a little, it's a little easier to make 
pretty again in comparison to a mirror polish. Though most notably, there's not a secondary bevel on this sword. It seems like, at least not a pronounced one, the edge seems to start right up at the fuller section here and gradually taper down all the way to the edge. There's not a, a very pronounced secondary bevel, which I believe aided substantially in cutting. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment, but in effect, it was a very, very effective cutter. Uh, the general geometry of the fuller runs up more than two-thirds of the blade, and then this last, se this last section here isn't really even hexagonal shape. There's not a pronounced central ridge towards the top. It looks like there's an attempt at one, but there's, there's really not even a central ridge. Now I'll talk about the dynamics of this sword and cutting. So I am not a student of Hema or history, and I don't I don't know how this sword should be used. Really, if it's a one hand or two hand, or what system of battle or, or martial arts would be used to, to operate this sword. But I can tell you a little bit about my experience, and that is that it is a one a very controllable sword, whether it be with one hand or with two. With one hand, I feel like I have control over the point. With two hands, I feel like I have more control. Whether it be in the cut or the thrust, it feels very well balanced. It's very light and nimble. I don't know that I'd want to whack it against armor, but in terms of a cut and thrust sword, it seems it seems very effective at either. It's quite long, but still controllable with one hand and overall quite light. It has a nice distal taper that runs along the blade. It's pretty flexible for, I mean, for what it is. It's a, a long sword, and oftentimes they're not as flexible as this, so it, it seems pretty springy, but it proved pretty rigid in the cut, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Anyway, there's a link to the Weapon Dynamics computer as well as you can see the Weapon Dynamics computer here. Uh, how I move it around is really not terribly important. If you know how this sword should move, hopefully the Weapon Dynamics computer provides more information to you than my simple It Feels Nice will. Uh, some things I will note is that the grip, uh, comfortable with one hand, regardless of really where I put it, it feels actually comfortable to, to move and hold. Um, if I put two hands on it, it doesn't bite into me. It's it's very comfortable to, to grip and hold and, and move around. I, I prefer to grab onto the pommel. If I do that, I do feel the pommel move. That could just be because the pommel needs to be tightened, um, but I have to kind of torque on it to get it to move. I do feel it move though. Anyway, it sounds nice if I give it a flick. has a, a nice ring to it overall. Uh, it's very it's a very comfortable sword to move around. It makes a nice swishing swishing sound as I as I move it. And just it's a, it's kind of a joy to move around. I was really surprised at how comfortable it is and how well uh, it seems to be executed. Now in terms of cutting, I did do some cutting of both water bottles and tatami mats. And this was one of the most enjoyable swords to cut with that I have I have gotten to experience. It doesn't have a pronounced secondary bevel. I'm suspecting that how the edge geometry is, is made has really aided it in the cut. Um, and <laughs> basically I cut with a myriad of different swords the day that I was cutting with this sword. And this one is the one that really surprised me the most. Now, I cut with some other katanas. I'm more used to cutting with katanas, so it doesn't surprise me that some of those perform better. However, as I compared this to the, uh, the VA Practical longsword, as I compared it to a larger kind of a Danish longsword as I compared it to other katanas. This sword just uh, really breathed through tatami mats very impressively. It was a really impressive sword to cut with, which surprised me because while well, the edge is sharp, it's not it's not what I would call razor sharp. It's, it's serviceably sharp. I mean, it certainly cuts, but I did not expect it to perform as well as it did and just to move through targets as easily as it did. It's very easy to index. It's very easy to move and control. If you're not a student of Hema like me, I'm, I'm not a student, but you have some passable familiarity with cutting. This was just kind of an easy button to pick up and cut with. A, a real joy to move around. Now is the part of the review where I can answer the question, do I personally think it's worth it or not? And in short, yes. Uh, that is, if what you buy today for $520 is similar to this, and presumably it's a little better, absolutely, I think it's worth the money. In particular, as I compare the sword and the edge geometry, how well it cuts, how well it feels in my hand, and really the scabbard and how functional and nice the scabbard is, all of those things combined really add a package together that I think is a good value for 520 bucks, especially as I compare it to other offerings. If I look at some of the similarities between this sword and some offerings I've seen from Dark Sword Armory, the scabbard in particular uh, is is really well fit. It doesn't rattle around. It feels a lot more like an actual scabbard, and it seems to be just a little tighter and better done. The blade also has some characteristics. It has less surface ripples. It doesn't have a pronounced secondary bevel. It's light and feels like a weapon. It's where many of the other $500 swords that come in similar packages feel overbuilt. This feels a little bit more like a weapon, a little closer to the way I would expect an actual sword to be. Swords weren't intended to be brutish clubs. They're a little bit more elegant than that, and that is how, how this feels. It doesn't feel overbuilt, which by the same token, if you go bash it against branches in your backyard, it's probably going to 
break a lot quicker than than some of the other offerings out there. Anyway, if you want something that feels a little bit more like a sword and comes with components that are a little more suited to their actual task, I think this is a very, very compelling offer, and I, 520 bucks seems like a pretty good deal to me. Anyway, that is what I have for you. I hope the video has been interesting. If you have any questions, throw them in the commentary down below. As always, cheers, and thanks for watching.